ओके सर माय टॉपिक फॉर टुडे स्लैब टेस्ट एंड मैनेजमेंट वी वुड बी गोइंग थ्रू द इंट्रोडक्शन एंड इटियोलॉजी क्लासिफिकेशन क्लिनिकल इवेल्युएशन रेडियोलॉजिकल इवेल्युएशन एंड मैनेजमेंट ऑप्शन इंट्रोडक्शन the uh, slap tear is one of the most common cause of shoulder pain and dysfunction in 1985 andrews first described superior labral pathologies and snyder later coined the term slap lesion in the year 1990 because of the location and characteristic tear extension patterns the blood uh, the vascular supply of the glenoid labrum arises from the suprascapular artery the circumflex cap, uh, scapular branch of the subscapular artery and posterior humeral circumflex artery vascularity is decreased in the anterior antero superior and superior parts of the labrum thus making them more vulnerable to injuries and having impaired healing potential the treatment of slap lesions continues to be a topic of controversy before going through slap uh, we would like to see the uh, common variants of the glenoid labrum the image b as you can see here is known as sublabral foramen a sublabral foramen is simply a focal detachment of the antero superior la labrum from the underlying glenoid and constitutes a normal variant of la uh, labrum on imaging it might be confused with a slap lesion or anterior labral tear uh, whereas the in image d uh, it is known as the buffered complex is a congenital glenoid labrum variant wherein the antero superior labrum is absent in 1 to 3 o'clock position and the middle <coughs> glenohumeral ligament is thickened and the image c is a combination of b and d etiology the specific etiology underlying the various slap tears presentation is multifactorial slap tears will commonly report with an acute onset of deep shoulder pain accompanied by mechanical symptoms such as popping locking or catching with various shoulder movements first is the uh, compression type classically advocated by snyder as his original case series from 1990 reported about half of the patients presentation was status post a fall on to the outstretch arm with the arm in varying degree of shoulder abduction uh, in traction type occurs secondary to sudden jerking movements or uh, after lifting heavy objects as we can see in the uh, in this image can occur after an unexpected pull on the arm uh, for example when two people are carrying heavy object when one suddenly lets go of his end this causes an inferior traction pull on the shoulder of the other end and third is the combined type uh second is the attritional slap injuries uh, which is mainly of the peel back mechanism compared to the acute traumatic slap injuries the overhead athletes are more likely to present with attritional based etiologies uh, the first image is the of a uh, resting shoulder in which it shows the attachment of the biceps which is taut uh, in uh, the mechanism of injury for a posterior slap lesion in baseball runners who slides head first into the base sustaining a sudden force abduction and external rotation of the shoulder in this position the biceps tendon force vector shift from anterior horizontal direction to a more vertical and posterior direction this causes the uh, torsional force at the base of the biceps that is transmitted to the posterior labrum such torsional forces tends to peel back of the labrum and can potentially cause tendon fiber failure from bone as an acute traumatic avulsion and this uh, similarly overhead athlete <clears throat> have a tight posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament the first image is of a resting shoulder and second is of an abducted shoulder in hyper abduction the posterior ighl is taut and the center of rotation is at the center of glenoid but in cases of overhead sport athletes the posterior ighl is contracted in late cocking and early deceleration phase and the contact point between the glenohumeral joint and the posterior glen inferior glenohumeral ligament shift posterior superiorly which has a direct impact on the superior labrum uh, why it is important it has two clinical implication uh, first is the surgical repair and second is the post slap repair rehabilitation in order to surgically repair the posterior slap lesion the torsional peel back must be neutralized this requires at least one suture anchor stabilizing the labrum posterior to the biceps to effectively counter the torsion suture anchor should be placed at the corner of the glenoid at 45 degree of insertion to uh, to most effectively restore the anatomy of mechanically effective way and uh, whereas in rehab in posterior slab 
collision, external rotation is avoided past zero degrees since that is where peelback mechanism occurs, even with no abduction. Because external rotation stresses the repaired posterior superior labrum, we now wait for at least three weeks before allowing external rotation beyond zero degree. The third is the degenerative slap lesion. Degenerative slap test can develop secondary to normal wear and tear pattern seen in patients with advanced age. Uh, this often affects the overhead laborers with increasing degree of association in patients over 40 years old. This is the first article which was published by uh, Stephen J. Snyder in 1990. Uh, it has specific pattern of injury of the superior labrum of shoulder was identified arthroscopically in 27 patients including in an included in a retrospective case of more than 700 shoulders. A uh, first coined the term slap lesion classified into four major groups. <coughs> Type 1, the superior labrum had marked fraying with degenerative appearance, but the peripheral edge remains <clears throat> firmly attached to the glenoid. In type 2, in addition to type 1, the superior labrum and attached biceps tendon were stripped of the underlying glenoid. Uh, type 3, a bucket handle tear was noted in the superior labrum central portion and the tear was displaceable into the joint while the peripheral portion of the labrum remained firmly attached. Type 4 is bucket handle tear of the su uh, superior labrum, similar to a type 3 as noted, but in addition, the tear was extended into the biceps tendon. <clears throat> uh, of this, the most common type which was found was type 2 and the least common was type 1. Uh, in this article, uh, Zahab, Zahab Asan et al., they had validated the Steiner classification for slap lesion, wherein they said the classification defined by uh, Snyder, though it gives importance to various types of slap lesion, but it does not hold true for clinical implication and prognosis of each kind. Uh, uh, the limitation of the uh, first classification was classification of slap tears using the original Snyder description lacks adequate reproducibility, did not differentiate a normal sublabel foramen from a slap lesion, large proportion of the original 27 patients were found to have concomitant shoulder disorders and it is possible that the observed superior label disorder could have been an incidental finding and although the diagnosis using the classification system often currently made pre-operatively based on MR images, the original atomic, uh, anatomic description was based solely on an arthroscopic diagnosis. So that's why uh, many classifications were invented. This, uh, the type 2 lesions as originally described by Snyder involved a detachment of the biceps anchor and the adjacent labrum from the bone with anterior superior location. Uh, but it was observed in three, uh, three different distinct locations and type 2 was classified into three subtypes and uh, anterior superior type 2 slap lesion, a posterior superior uh, slap lesion which termed as posterior slap and combined anterior and posterior type 2 slap lesions. The conclusion of this study was posterior type had distinct clinical and anatomic, anatomical features from the anterior. Posterior and combined can be disabling to overhead athletes. Uh, Job's relocation test is positive with posterior and combined. The rotator cuff tests mostly commonly are associated with posterior and combined. Uh, Mark uh, Moffat et al. classified further. Uh, in, in this study, 84 patients form the basis of which 52 patients of the 84 had lesions that fit within the Snyder classification. Rest 32 patients did not fit into that classification. So uh, they all fitted in three distinct groups. Uh, that is type 5, an anterior inferior bank cut lesion continues superiorly to include a separation of the biceps tendon. Type 6, an unstable flap tear of the labrum presented in addition to the biceps tendon separation. Whereas type 7, the superior labrum biceps tendon separation extends anteriorly beneath the glenohumeral ligament. Uh, recently, uh, Scott E. Powell et al. classified the last uh, three classifications. Type 8 lesions in a, in a slap lesion extension along the posterior glenoid labrum as far as 6 o'clock position. Type 9 is a panlabral slap injury extending the entire circumference of the glenoid. Whereas type 10 injury is a superior labral tear associated with posterior inferior labral tear. The clinical evaluation. History is most important. Any history of sudden jerk 
uh, jerking force to the shoulder with an associated onset of pain, history of uh, uh, current episode of any shoulder instability, common slap provoking sports include uh, overhead sports like volleyball, baseball, pitchers, javelin and swimming. And uh, symptoms uh, are acute onset of deep shoulder pain, rest pain, night pain, popping, locking, catching with various movements and activity. It can be associated with long of biceps tendonitis. The physical examination is important uh, as in uh, cervical spine examination and shoulder examination. There are specific tests. First is the speed test. Uh, speed test, uh, the patient attempts to forward elevate the shoulder against examiner resistance. The elbow is slightly flexed and forearm supinated. Considered positive when pain is elicited in the bicepital group. The Yergesen test, the arm is stabilized against the patient trunk and elbow is flexed to 90 degree and forearm, and forearm pronated. The examiner manually resists pronation while the patient also externally rotate the arm against resistance. A positive test is noted if the patient reports pain over the bicepital group. The upper cut test, the involved shoulder is positioned at neutral and elbow is flexed to 90 degree. The forearm is supinated and patient makes a fist. The examiner instructs the patient to perform a boxing uppercut punch while placing the hand over the patient's fist to resist the upward motion. A positive test is uh, when patient feels a painful pop over the anterior shoulder near the bicepital groove region. The bicep load 2 test or KIM2 test. In this, the patient is supine position with shoulder in 120 degree of elevation, full external rotation, while the elbow is in 90 degree of flexion and the forearm is in supination. The patient is then asked to flex the elbow as the clinician provides resistance. The positive test is defined when the patient experiences pain during the elbow flexion. O'Brien test, active compression test, is the most specific for slap tear in which the patient is standing and the arm of the interest is positioned at 90 degree of forward flexion and 10 degree of adduction and internally rotation so that the thumb points to the floor. And we apply downward pressure and uh, we tell the patient to resist. Now, uh, in this patient, uh, if the patient feels any pain, then the test is considered to be positive. A dynamic labral shear test uh, to perform the te uh, this test, uh, we stand behind the patient and hold the affected arm at wrist at one with one hand while apply an anteriorly directed force on the proximal humerus near the joint line. Uh, then elevate the patient arm to 150 degree. This uh, test is considered positive when uh, the patient reports pain or uh, patient, uh, examiner feels a click uh, in the posterior joint line between 90 to 120 degree of elevation. Labral tension test. To conduct this test, the patient lies supine and examiner places the arm in 120 degree of abduction and neutral forearm rotation. The shoulder is then taken into end range of external rotation. At this end range, the examiner grasps the hand, patient's hand and asks him to supinate the forearm against resistance. This test is considered positive if patient has an increased pain with resisted supination. Uh, uh, in uh, 2008, a new test was uh, found out, the supine flexion resistance test. Uh, the supine flexion resistance test is performed with the patient in supine position. The patient is asked to rest the arm over the head in full elevation with the forearm resting or the palate on the palm facing upwards. As in, you can see the uh, figure one. The exam is positioned adjacent to the patient on the same side as, as, uh, as of the examined shoulder and grasps the patient's arm distal to the elbow. Then the patient is asked to perform a forward flexion of the arm as if simulating a throwing motion. The test is considered positive only, uh, only if the pain is elicited deep inside the shoulder joint. Um, the conclusion of this uh, paper was compared with O'Brien test and speed test, the supine flexion resistance test proved to be more specific. This test is also useful and effective test for detecting type 2 slap lesions. The high specificity allows to a great extent elimination of false positive results as compared to the other test. Uh, this study by Chad Cook et al. Uh, studied about the various clinical tests and their impact upon the diagnosis. They compared tests like active compression test, KIM2 test, dynamic labral shear test, speed test and labral tension test and said that no test gave an actual outcome which would say that they are specific for slap tests. But considered uh, if all the tests are clubbed together but concluded that if all the tests are clubbed together then the specificity increases. 
as we can see in the last column, uh, five out of five positive case, the specificity increases to 84%. Radiological evaluation, plain radiographs, radiographs as an AP view, Grashi's outlet and axillary view, while no specific radiographic findings are pathognomic for slap lesions, other coexisting conditions such as Bennett lesion, which is nothing but mineralization of the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament or outlet impingement or an acro acromioclavicular pathological abnormalities may be detected. Currently, MRI is the gold standard for the detection of labral injuries in particularly MR arthrography. This article spoke substantially about the imaging aspects of diagnosing slap lesion. Before going into imaging proper, he also mentioned about the normal variant and should not be confused with slap test. The first is a buffered complex, nothing but the condensation of the MGHL and absence of anterior superior labrum uh, as seen in this pic and should not be confused with a slap or bankard tear. Uh, so the second image is a sublabral sulcus or recess is usually confined to the superior labrum at 11 to 1 o'clock position at the site of attachment of the long head of biceps tendon. It is a sulcus between the capsulolabral complex and the superior glenoid cartilage. Type 1 slap tear, we, uh, uh, abnormal contour and fraying of the superior labrum without labral tear or detachment from the glenoid with, without biceps tendon involvement. In type 2, uh, uh, there is biceps tendon involvement from the glenoid and labral tear. The MR arthrogram shows literally uh, laterally oriented high signal in labrum. Type 3 bucket handle tear of the superior labrum shows displacement of the torn central part of the labrum into the joint while biceps tendon remain attached to the glenoid. The MR arthrogram shows a bucket handle tear, anterior superior tear of the superior labrum. A double Oreo, uh, double Oreo cookie sign is seen on the MRI of type 3 slab tear. The bucket handle tear paralleling sublabral recess resulting in two parallel high intensity Intensity lines referred to as double Oreo cookie sign. The fluid is in between the labrum and the glenoid cartilage. In type 4, it shows a bucket handle tear of the superior labrum with extension of the tear into the biceps tendon. <coughs> type 5, the tear of the superior labrum shows extension into the antero, <coughs> antero inferior labral tear from 5 o'clock position to superior labrum at 12 o'clock position with involvement of biceps tendon. Type 6, shows superior labral flap tear extending from the bicep, extending to the biceps with small labral fragment partially attached to the superior labrum. Type 7 shows superior labral tear with extension to the middle glenohumeral ligament. MR arthrogram shows the slap tear with extension to the MGHL uh, which has been described. Type 7 slap tear shows slap uh, tear with extension to the posterior inferior labrum extending from 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock position. Type 9 shows detachment of the labrum from glenoid as a result of significant anterior and posterior extension of the superior labral tear. Type 10 shows superior labral tear with extension to the rotator interval or structures that crossing it including the long head of biceps tendon, superior glenohumeral ligament and coracohumeral ligament. Uh, we coming to the management. The conservative management of slab tear is often unsuccessful, particularly when there is component of glenohumeral joint instability or concomitant rotator cuff tear. In this article by Sarah L. Edwards uh, said that uh, rest and ref uh, uh, we should do a trial of conservative management as it is effective. Uh, first, rest and refrain from any overhead activities, a short course of anti-inflammatory and once the pain subsides, we should start with physio with mostly posterior capsular stretching. Uh, as we can see in this bar diagram, uh, there is improved shoulder functional outcome scores uh, as compared to uh, by only uh, conservative management. This study concluded that uh, successful non-operative treatment of superior label uh, tears results in improved pain relief and functional outcome compared to pre-treatment assessment. There is one more article which suggested that return to uh, play following non-surgical management of superior labrum anterior posterior tears. The, uh, it was a systematic review was performed from the articles published before March 2021. Five articles met the inclusion criteria and there were 244 athletes. Type 2 slap test was the most common of all. The timing of return to play was generally less than six months in studies that reported it. 
the conclusion of the study was non operative treatment of uh, slap tears in athletes can be successful especially in the subset of patients who are able to complete the rehab program before attempting a return to play the surgical management which was described by uh, uh, powell et al in this article uh, mainly states that uh, for type 1 and 2 it was mainly arthroscopic repair in type 1 debridement would be enough uh, in type 3 it can be treated with simple debridement of the buckle ha bucket handle portion of the biceps anchor and superior labrum in some cases if the labrum is not too badly frayed bucket handle can be repaired in type 4 uh, most commonly treated with debridement of the bucket handle portion of the tissue and if the tear extending into the biceps involves greater than 50 percent of the diameter biceps tenodesis or tenotomy was recommended type 5 repair of the uh, type 5 included fixation of the biceps root as in type 2 and continuing with the anchor to incorporate the bank cut lesion in type 6 it was best treated with debridement of the flap tear and fixation as in type 2 type 7 included fixation of the superior labrum as in type 2 and suturing the mghl ligament type 7 were treated as same as type 2 with fixation in of the posterior reverse bank cut lesion Type 9 or panlabral lesion is treated with anchors anterior, posterior, superior with a capsular shift and type 10 are treated as same as the type 8 lesion with or without biceps stenodesis. Uh, there was an article in 2018 which gave the al treatment algorithm for, uh, for the most common types of slab, slab tests that is 1 to 4. Slab 1 should be treated conservative therapy or debridement. Slab 2 was uh, divided into two young active patient recent trauma with good quality of labrum slab repair, older inactive patient with poor quality of labrum, tenotomy or tenodesis. Uh, slab uh, for type 3, resection of the bucket handle tear. For type 4, age is uh, less than uh, more than 40, less than 40 with uh, more than 40 with low activity level with no aesthetic issues tenotomy of the biceps tendon with age less than 40 high activity level tenodesis of the biceps tendon. Uh, this is the last article uh, arthroscopic treatment uh, according to this author biceps tenodesis was an alternative to reinsertion uh, did good to the patients uh, and uh, this was uh, in this article mainly 25 patients were treated uh, treated with slab repair or biceps tenodesis. The slab repair was uh, done for 10 patients. Uh, the slab repair was performed using reabsorbable sutures anchor placed at 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock position on the glenoid. After debridement of the unstable flaps, the abrasion of the non-articular bony bed, suture anchors were immediately inserted into the glenoid rim at an angle approximately of 45 degree. Whereas uh, the rest 15 patients was treated with tenodesis. In this, all patients underwent arthroscopic biceps tenodesis according to the fixation described by the author Boilio et al using an interference screw fixation. After the biceps tenotomy, the tendon is exteriorized and doubled on a suture. The biceps tendon is then pulled into the humeral socket drilled at the top of the bicepital groove and fixed with an bioabsorbable interference screw. In this uh, uh, biceps tenodesis, uh, more than 93% patients were satisfied with 87% returned to their athletics without any symptom. The in concluded that the arthroscopic biceps tenodesis using an interference screw technique is an effective alternate way to suture anchor repair of an isolated type 2 slap lesion. Arthroscopic biceps tenodesis can be an excellent salvage procedure for in cases of any failed slap repair. My take home message is would be uh, it is the one of the most missed disease. Popularity of the overhead sports, diagnosis and management of slap lesion uh, remains controversial. A uh, detailed history and physical examination are more valuable than imaging. Non-operative management focuses on scapular rebalancing and posterior uh, capsular stretching is an effective method to treat. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Prashant, uh, Praveen. Uh, we'll uh, go to the next presentation and after that, we'll have the discussion. Yes, sir. Morning, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, carry on. Uh, so I'll be presenting today on as a continuation of Praveen's presentation on long head of biceps tendon. 
long hair or biceps basically basic biceps has two branches one is the long head and the short head so be looking into the long head the long head starts from the superior glenoid tubercle and goes on inserting into the radial tuberosity down it crosses the arm it has no attachments in the arm it starts from the tubercle it in uh, intraarticular part comes up loops around uh, goes through the bicepital groove comes down and gets inserted into the radial tuberosity Controversy exists pers uh, persists regarding the function of the long head of biceps. We have uh, disorders like the uh, tendinopathies, degenerative uh, disorders, overuse, and traumatic causes. Tendinitis is nothing but inflammation of or tenosynovitis, that is inflammation of the paratenon around. This can occur independently or can occur as a co-commentant along with the cuff injuries or a, a lateral pathology. Like I mentioned, long head of biceps originates from the superior supraglenoid tubercle and the superior labrum and inserts distally into the radial tuberosity. Uh, the bicepital groove is, a, groove is an hourglass-shaped sh corridor through which this tendon traverses. It helps to contain the long head of biceps, but mostly resists it coming out and prevents the head from going anteriorly. So it also acts like a dynamic restraint. It is rich in sensory and sympathetic nervous innervation and it has relatively less vascular zones. Like I mentioned, the bicepital groove is nothing but a groove formed by the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity. Uh, the ridge between the two is the groove through which this tendon passes. This tendon inferiorly is covered by the superior uh, porohumeral ligament. You will find after it comes out, uh, the bicepital groove that is overpassed by this ligament, the uh, the MI, M, uh, MGHL, you have uh, superiorly and then you have the subscap inferiorly of the AIGHL and the falciform ligament. Down further, you will have the pectoralis major tendon. Like Praveen mentioned, this uh, has a co-combatant or it goes hand in hand with the slap lesions. Uh, so that has to be really looked into as to what the main pathology is. So, like I said, uh, the main function of the biceps, it acts as a biomechanical stabilizer. It acts as a dynamic stabilizer of the shoulder joint. Thus, it is used in procedures like the DAS procedure or uh, such procedures where dynamic stabilization is enhanced or augmented. It also acts as a humeral head depressor and an anterior stabilizer. The spectrum of conditions from inflammatory tendonitis to degenerative tendinosis, this concomitant likely arises secondly due to repetitive traction, friction, and rotation, uh, as well as shear forces that, uh, uh, that act on this particular tendon. Uh, diabetes is one of the main causes which leads to tendon attrition and uh, further aggravates this insult to injury. The sheath of the tendon is an extension of the synovial lining of the shoulder joint which can become inflamed in conjunction, tenosynovitis. That is uh, the most common thing that a patient will present will, uh, will be tenderness at the bicepital groove. So these are the few different uh, uh, causes that give rise to bicepital, uh, long head of biceps tendonitis. You'll have shoulder pathologies like AC joint pathologies, cuff pathologies, uh, long head of biceps pathologies, uh, isolated labral pathologies, capsulitis, and instability. So this will not be, in, mostly this is seen as a chronic uh, or a progressive disorder rather than some acute uh, condition. The function of the biceps will decline. So the patient will complain of decreasing supination power or decreasing flexion of the elbow power. The pain is often limited to the, uh, the region of the groove, the bicepital groove. It may radiate down towards the, anti uh, the along the length of the tendon into the, uh, the elbow or into the forearm. A uh, patient can hear some clicking, popping sounds and audible while throwing. Like I mentioned, it starts from the supraglenoid notch, curves upwardly. It is covered by the CHL, comes down, covered by again uh, the uh, uh, your uh, subscap and uh, the superior cuff goes between the through. There's a transverse ligament attached on the bicepital groove. Then comes down, you have the MGHL and the AIGHL that uh, form downwards. 
So when you are examining, you have three major tests that uh, you do for identifying uh, long head of biceps pathologies. First is the speech test. So in this patient is asked to uh, flex his shoulder while keeping his elbow straight and extended. Uh, and the, uh, this is done against the resistance of the examiner. Uh, any tenderness or any pain elicited it or at the bicepital groove gives suspicion to biceps uh, pathology. Second is the Jorgensen test where the patient is asked to supinate against resistance in a flexed elbow. Any pain elicited or any pain noticed at the bicepital groove gives suspicion to uh, biceps pathology. If there's a tendon tear or if there's a tendon attrition, a uh, patient might present with a sign called as the Popeye sign, where, where you see that the long head of biceps has split or avulsed from its origin and come down. So you'll see a small bulge and the whole uh, uh, the anatomy or the normal musculature of the biceps or the arm is lost. Uh, the X-rays will rule out other pathologies that are co -co -co competent with the biceps tendon pathology. Like sometimes you can have calcific tendonitis or calcific lesion might be seen. Along with that, some uh, Bankart's lesion or a Hillsax lesion, those pathologies will be picked into by an X-ray. Gold standard is, like uh, Praveen also mentioned, the MRI. Uh, it investigates into the tendon. It can look into the quality of the tendon. It can look into the quality of the sheath and the, uh, the sort of inflammation. A quick and upcoming test nowadays is the uh, ultrasonography. So, but this is highly skill required. It is operator dependent. Uh, stuff, uh, uh, small pathologies like subluxation or small uh, ruptures or tears might be missed. One minute, but it can also act um, as a therapeutic as well as a diagnostic uh, uh, test. Coming to non-operative management. Uh, first, primarily is your rice therapy that you go in for rest, uh, activity mo modification, NSAIDs, physiotherapy, underlying... Uh, giving strengthening exercises to the scapula to prevent, uh, to correct the scapular dyskinesis or prevent, uh, correct the rhythm. And uh, if this doesn't work, then you go in for a ultrasound, uh, ultrasound guided or a plain uh, uh, steroid injection into the bicepital groove. Normally, uh, when you have a uh, long head of biceps ten. Hello? Hello? Carry on, carry on. Sorry. Am I audible? Please continue, Rohit. Yes, you're audible. Please yeah, sorry, continue. I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you, actually. I couldn't hear you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the uh, can I continue, sir? Can I start, uh, continue? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. So the uh, injection is given into the bicepital groove. So normally when you have a uh, biceps tendonitis, uh, along with that, along with that, you have uh, some sort of uh, 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 bursitis as well. So this can either be in the subacromial bursa or the subdeltoid bursa. So normally what uh, uh, surgeons do is they give, uh, they take 2 ml of steroid and mix it with uh, 6 ml of uh, lignocaine or uh, VPOcaine. Uh, mix the whole thing, inject 4 ml into the groove and 4 ml into the acromial uh, subacromial space. So depending on your pathology, you would like to infiltrate in that particular region. If this doesn't work, you would go in for two types of surgeries. Mainly, you have the tenotomy versus the tenodesis. Each, have its own, each has its own pros and each has its own cons. So the tenotomy is nothing but uh, cutting the tendon and separating it from its origin. This provides majorly, uh, uh, it, it, so what this major does is, it, it's a quick and simple procedure. It is a reproducible procedure that can be performed arthroscopically or in an open manner. It requires little or post no post-op rehab and it is very convenient. It, a normal single ant anterior portal is made uh, for instrumentation and a posterior portal is made for viewing. Uh, the grasp, uh, the cutter is taken in or a blade is taken in. It is put in, the long head of biceps is identified and it is slit in, uh, in a single uh, attempt. So what this does is this takes away the tension on the biceps and releases the tension, thus prevents post-operative pain.
The cons for this is cosmesis. Uh, most of the patients, especially the thin, uh, the thin patients, the lanky patients will have some sort of popoid deformity. And uh, also some patients might complain of fatigue on supination and elbow uh, flexion. Uh, before coming into the tenodesis part, uh, normally what uh, surgeons would prefer is uh, uh, to do a tenotomy for patients who are older, who are obese, uh, who do not have manual working jobs, uh, those who aren't uh, worried about the appearance of the, the Popeye appearance, or those who are unable or unwilling to comply with post-operative rehab or care. Tenodesis, uh, the pros is basically... Uh, it maintains the length and tension of the relationship of the biceps tendon with the arm and the forearm. Uh, prevents post-operative muscle atrophy. Prevents fatigue and cramping. Thus, the patient will complain less of uh, elbow uh, pain during elbow flexion or supination. Uh, it helps to maintain the normal contour of the muscle and the arm. Uh, the cons are it's more technical, it's more demanding, it's more challenging. A longer anesthetic period is required. There is more risk, additional wound. This can be performed arthroscopically as well as through open procedures. It is more expensive as implants have to be put in and it's a, uh, it has a longer post-op rehab. So this, like I mentioned, tenodesis can be of multiple types. It can be pro uh, performed proximally with the tendon in the groove or distally out of the tendon. Arthroscopically, the ten, uh, not, uh, similar to tenotomy, here you have the uh, the viewing portal, which is posteriorly. Anteriorly, you have the instrumentation portal. Here you've taken a bite through the tendon. Then a tenotomy proximally is performed. After this, the tendon is uh, tensioned. Uh, stitches in the form of whip stitch are, performed, uh, are, uh, are uh, put into the tendon. And a small nick is made through which through which uh, your screw or uh, some uh, fixation device is passed. Open can be subpectoral approach. Uh, normally, this a small 2 cm, 3 cm incision is taken below the deltoid, below the, sub, uh, below the pectoralis major muscle. This is opened, split, the tendon is identified, the tendon is cut as proximally as possible and stripped. After this, the fresh, uh, fresh tendon part is kept and the degenerative tendon part is removed. Whip stitches are put in the form of, uh, uh, with the help of ethibond or proline or uh, some non-absorbable uh, suture material. Uh, along with this, a small, uh, the length of the tendon is identified as to how much the tension should be given. Uh, a drill is made into the anterior uh, humerus and then this tendon along with a screw or another fixation device is passed through this hole and fixed into the tendon. Normally, when you do a tenodesis, you have a rehab protocol. Normally, this protocol that we follow is four, week, four weeks of arm sling, no active and elbow uh, flexion for four weeks. And then after eight weeks, we start with strengthening. After three to four months, uh, you can have unrestricted post-op activities. Uh, so who would you go in for a tenodesis? A younger patient, an active patient, a patient who has thin arms, very uh, le less amount of fat, a patient who does not want a, a deformity, a popoid deformity, a younger patient, especially females, those who not wanting com cosmetic deformities, those who are performing manual jobs like laborers and stuff and willing to take part in the rehab. So take home message, always identify the pathology and the cause of the biceps involvement. Biceps is always an important source of post-operative pain. So that has to be dealt with properly in the form of a tenotomy or a tenodesis. And patient factors have to be taken into consideration before choosing in or before going in for a tenotomy or a tenodesis. Thank you. Thanks, Rodez. So um, basically, uh, we, we have to consider both lap lesions or lesions of the longer of biceps as one single entity. It is just the location of the pathology that uh, determines whether it's a slap lesion or longer of biceps lesion. So what we do here in North Zone is we basically try to uh, divide it according to the location of involvement of the biceps tendon and uh, the uh, mode of injury. So usually any injury to the longer of biceps can be acute traumatic or it can be chronic repetitive. The chronic repetitive occurs mainly because of 
imbalance in the scapulohumeral rhythm and uh, that is commonly seen in overhead athletes uh, and uh, you know people who complain of uh, pain especially while throwing they complain of pain either in the post or superior aspect which is classical of internal impingement or pain confined to the longer of biceps which is mainly uh, due to the additional stress that the longer of biceps is um, put on because of the scapulohumeral dysrhythm so these patients are more prone to have uh, scapular uh, dyskinesis and glenohumeral internal rotation deficit which directly affects the longer of biceps resulting in the longer of biceps tendinosis or even a tear so in such patients yes the role for conservative treatment plays a very important uh, 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 role uh, you have to treat them conservatively uh, correct the scapulohumeral dysrhythm uh, induce um, the posterior uh, capsular stretch and then uh, now, most of the time it is uh, successful and the patient gets back to activity level. If the patient does not improve after these uh, uh, issues, then we have to locate the lesion, locate the lesion in the longer of biceps. Acute traumatic cases, it is obvious in the presence of uh, scalp lesion in acute trauma, then we have to identify what is the type of uh, treatment that we have to give. Now, we have a protocol here, which means any high demand athletes, which are most commonly between the age group of 19 to 45 years, high demand, uh, having uh, lesions of the longer of biceps, irrespective of the location, whether it is in the supraglenoid area or whether it's in the biceps pulley area or whether it's in the biceps group, we don't worry about the type of denotices. The universally, we, we try to do um, the subpectoral denotices. I'll come to the reason why later. Uh, if it is a normal patient, say for example, if it's a 40 year old male patient who is complaining of longer of biceps uh, pathology, uh, first thing is decision making on determining the location. If the longer of biceps location is confined to the supraglenoid tubercle in the form of a slap lesion, or if it is confined to the intraarticular portion in the form of a biceps pulley lesion, then we can definitely uh, um, do a tenodesis confined to the juxta articular area that is near the articular margin. If the lesion is confined to the biceps groove or anywhere below, then there's no point in doing a juxta articular tenodesis because the presence of inflammation is still there and uh, the patient will definitely complain of pain post-operatively and in such cases, a, sub a subpectoral tenodesis is needed. Now, why not do a slap lesion? Slap lesion is a, a slap repair, uh, lesion repair is uh, uh, always uh, a debatable topic because initially, previously, people were doing a lot of slap repairs because technically easier, but the problem is the presence of post-operative pain and persistent inflammation in the longer of biceps or sometimes over-tightening of the slap repair also leads to persistent pain and a decreased functional outcome in overhead throwing athletes. And in such groups, uh, uh, the classical paper by Anthony Romeo, which has compared slap repair with bicep tenodesis in overhead throwing athletes. Uh, this was uh, published, uh, in, I think, in 2017 or 18. They have clear cut uh, given uh, uh, the uh, their opinion that both slab repair and biceps tenodesis have got very good functional outcome. They are as good as uh, um, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, getting the longer of biceps to a normal functional level. But the only problem is the incidence of revision surgery, the incidence of post operative pain, and the incidence of post operative steroid injection is much higher in the slap repair group compared to the tenodesis group. Now, put, directly put it in our population. We have a high demand athlete coming to our uh, setup, uh, opting for surgery. We don't want him to come back to our uh, hospital again and again with persistent pain. And that's the reason why we have to choose one surgery which has to give him complete relief or near normal relief. And in such cases, the subpectoral tenodesis, tenodesis seems to be a very good option both uh, in uh, getting the functional outcome as well as post-operative pain relief. And that is one primary reason why we think uh, biceps uh, kinodesis is a far better option compared to a slap repair. We hardly do any slap repair. Now, when do we do slap repair? The chance of uh, the slap repair healing well is very high when it is associated with the labral pathology. Because in an isolated type 2 slap lesion, the labrum, anti-labrum, posterior labrum is tightly fixed. Okay. And uh, in such cases, uh, when you do the slap repair with an abnormal tension or when you try to over tension it, you're actually fixing the longer of biceps uh, firm. So when the arm is taken into supraphysiological load, that will lead to pain. 
this may not happen in cases of you know, associated uh, bank card lesion or post label lesion where there is some uh, to and fro motion in the labrum which may compensate for it. The reason is many of the overhead throwing athletes have something called a good slap lesion, which means they have anatomically an MRI wise uh, slap lesion which can be picked up in MRI, but it is asymptomatic. This actually adds uh, advantage to their throwing activities. So when we try to repair the slap in an over tightened fashion, you're actually compromising the function of the biceps and that may lead to um, uh, post-operative pain. And recently we have also seen uh, the presence of not induced chondrolysis in the humeral head if the anchor is not placed or not is not placed in the correct position. So given a, a choice whether to do a slap repair or a bicep stenodesis, I would strongly vouch for bicep stenodesis as a better option in, uh, in high demand athletes because of the incidence of uh, less post-operative pain and uh, improved functional outcome, usually six months post-op surgery. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, is my screen visible, sir? Yes, sir, John. So, good morning, sir. I am welcome everyone to today's plastic talk. Uh, in today's talk, I'll be discussing about the alignment techniques in total knee arthroplasty. So, this is a brief overview of my presentation. I'll be discussing regarding the native knee anatomy, the tibiofemoral alignment, the classification of alignment types, the mechanical alignment, the anatomical alignment, kinematic alignment, adjusted mechanical alignment, the restricted kinematic alignment, inverse kinematic alignment, and functional alignment, and finally about the CPA classification. So in the native knee, if you notice, on bipedal stands, there is an oblique joint line. But with activities like running and walking, the center of mass shifts laterally especially in a in the single leg stance and the hip adducts and the joint line becomes more horizontal. In distal femur, there's a slight valgus align alignment and in proximal tibia, there's a slight valgus alignment of one to five degree. In the sagittal plane, the proximal tibia has a tibial slope ranging from one to nine, while distal femoral sagittal alignment usually lies between zero and three degrees of flexion. In addition, the mechanics the, all of us know that the mechanical axis in the sagittal plane is variable and it follows a J, J curve. And one point that has been noted is that when in the absence of ACL and PCL, any change in tibial slope can affect the anteroposterior stability of the knee. In the axial plane, the axis flexion is a surgical trans epicondylar axis. That is the line between the lateral epicondyle and the sulcus in the medial epicondyle. The tibial axial alignment, it is less important uh, compared to the uh, femoral axial alignment in success of TKA. And regarding the optimal rotation of the tibial component, it's, uh, there's, it's not universally accepted, but we usually keep the tibial component al along a line connecting the fossa of the posterior crucial ligament to the junction of middle third and lateral two third of the tibial tubercle, which is commonly referred to as the insert line. So all of us know regarding the tibiofemoral alignment, the posterior condylar axis, uh, we know what is an anatomical axis and the mechanical axis. There is the mechanical axis makes a six degrees with the anatomical axis and for the nine degrees with the vertical axis. In the tibia, the anatomical and mechanical axis for all practical purposes are collinear. It makes three degree with the vertical axis. So we know about the LDFA, how to plot the LDFA, how to plot the MPTA, the joint line convergence angle. So I'm not going detailed into that. The femoral, the femoral and tibial longitudinal axis form an angle of 185 to 190 degree medially at the knee. That is 5 to 10 degree of valgus at knee. In bilateral stand space, there's equal distribution of weight on medial and lateral condyle. So in 1980, Insel and Ranaut introduced the mechanical alignment. The um, when mechanical alignment was introduced, it uh, it was it became very popular as it was a reproducible approach. The implants were aligned to create a neutral limb axis, and it produces it produced acceptable clinical outcome and implants are available. But a fraction of people who underwent mechanical al alignment was not satisfactory. 
So Hungerford and Krakow introduced the anatomical alignment in 1985. Uh, the, in the anatomical alignment, the jawline is more oblique and the neutral limb axis is recreated. It is more physiological kind of total knee arthroplasty because the, there is a middle sloping jawline like the native knee. The problem with this was that was that the jawline obliquity varied in population. So there came a need for other patient-specific alignment strategies like constitutional alignment, kinematic alignment, etc. And further towards the end of 2010, the functional alignment came into existence. So again, the mechanical alignment, it was the concept came in 1980 by around 1985. The concept of anatomical alignment came. The constitutional alignment came concept first came in 2000s. And constitutional kinematic and kinematic alignment are more or less the same. And functional al alignment, the concept came around uh, 2010. So the classification of alignment types. The alignment types can be classified into three types. The systematic alignment, the kinematic alignment, and the hybrid alignment. The systematic alignment includes a mechanical alignment and an anatomical alignment. The goal here is to restore the normal alignment with hip, knee, ankle axis of 180 degree for all patients, irrespective of the preoperative alignment. Whatever be the preoperative alignment, whatever be the preoperative HK, it is restored to the neutral alignment. Kinematic alignment is patient-specific. Patient it aims to maintain the native limb alignment and jawline inclination. So only the surface of the articular surface is replaced. The unicondylar knee follows the kinematic alignment. It, then comes the hybrid alignment, which is a hybrid of the two. That is, they aim to restore the coron coronal alignment with an HKA to a safe zone of 177 to 183. It includes the restricted kinematic alignment, the inverse kinematic alignment, the adjusted mechanical alignment, and the functional alignment. I, I'll explain about each of these alignment in further slides. So again, what you see on the right side is a mechanical alignment. In mechanical, mechanical alignment, we are taking cuts perpendicular to the mechanical axis and we are pre putting in the components. So the we are restoring it to a neutral axis. In anatomical alignment, we are re restoring it to a neutral axis, but we are keeping the femoral component in 3 degree valgus and a corresponding tibial component in 3 degree varus. Then comes the patient specific alignment types of the left side, which in which the native knee kinematics is and the joint inclination, the alignment is retained. And the hybrid alignment types are the more recent alignment strategies, which includes the restricted kinematic alignment and the adjusted mechanical alignment. In the concept of adjusted mechanical alignment is to undercorrect the femoral deformity to three degree with uh, in in the in the femur component and the restricted kinematic alignment it is to restrict to uh, the alignment to less than three degrees of deformity and less than five degrees of jawline obliquity. So I'll come to details in the, in the subsequent slides. So mechanical alignment it can be defined as we all of us know about mechanical alignment it can be defined as implanting both tibial and femoral components perpendicular to the limb's mechanical axis. And the coronal targets are achieved by referencing the bony res bone resection to the femoral and tibial anatomical axis. This is still the gold standard alignment strategy. So what is the criticism regarding the me mechanical alignment? All of us know that the medial femoral condyle is more distal than the lateral femoral condyle. The medial tibial condyle is concave, the lateral tibial condyle surface is convex. The medial jawline is more distal than the lateral jawline. But in when we do a mechanically aligned TK, uh, we recreate a jawline which is at the same level. That is, we recreate the we make the lateral jawline at the level of the medial jawline. So there is a distal distalization of the lateral jawline which distorts the patellofemoral mechanics and causes lateral overstuffing. So it's an, it's not a patient-specific strategy. So why mechanically pos mechanical position of knee implants is being challenged? The first pillar of the mechanical alignment technique is to align knee components systematically perpendicular to the femoral and tibial axis, as we discussed earlier. But recent evidence suggests that knee kinematics is dictated by three main axes. 
and the transepicondylar axis is the one upon which the tibia effectively rotates around the femur from 10 to 120 degrees of knee flexion. The second pillar of mechanical alignment technique is that a neutrally aligned knee when standing creates a bio B. The, there was a conception that a neutrally aligned knee on standing, it's more biomechanically stable, better, and it persists even during the gait. But many studies have challenged this dogma and they have found that the static standing limb alignment poorly predicts the risk of long-term mechanical alignment TK failure. And the last pillar is based on the assumption that generating rectangular and identical extension and flexion gaps could be clinically beneficial. But recent studies suggest that preserving the physical ligament laxity difference between the medial and lateral compartments and between the flexion and extension space may in fact be clinically advantageous. Now, mechanical alignment, it came to existence in 1980 and the anatomical alignment came to existence in 1985. It was described by Hungerford and Krakow. So, it, it followed a process of measured resection by introducing a 3-degree femoral valgus and 3-degree tibial varus. The femoral component was aligned to the posterior condylar axis. When it was first introduced in 1985, the concept was criticized because it was technically challenging. And with the advent of robotics and navigation and robotics, there's renewed interest in the concept. And this concept is viewed as a precursor to the kinematic alignment. The criticism is that when it was introduced in 1980, 1985, the implant system with the which the philosophy was associated turned out to be associated with accelerated polyethylene wear. So there was a general concern that this underlying anatomical alignment philosophy played an important role. Also, at that point of time, there was no navigation, no robotics. So there was, there was chance for excessive varus tibial cuts. And gradually it faded out. And around 2010, the studies claimed that 20% of the patients undergoing TKA are dissatisfied. Though it has been revised in the recent studies in 2023, this is a systematic review that only 10 per patient of the patients and 10 percent of the patients undergoing TK are dissatisfied. So this is a landmark paper which came which came from Belgium by Johan Bellaman in 2012, where he questioned the neutral if the neutral mechanical alignment is normal for all patients. He found out that the 32 percent. He did a study in healthy individuals and he found that 32% of the males and 17% of female had a constitutional varus knees with natural mechanical alignment more than 3 degree. One of the reasons for the constitutional varus is the intense sports activities during the growth which can lead to the development of varus knees, especially at the end of the growth spurt. So let's move forward to the kinematic alignment technique. The kinematic alignment technique, it's a true knee surfacing, like how we are doing for a hip resurfacing technique. It's patient specific and ligament sparing. It is a complete bony procedure which restores the native knee, pre, native pre-arthritic pre -arthritic limp and joint line ligaments and knee laxity. So in kinematic alignment, the TK components are set respective to three kinematic axes. There's a cylindrical axis or the condylar axis. It is the axis between the centers of the estimated circle of medial and lateral condyle. The patellar axis is parallel to the cylindrical axis and located anterior and superior to it. And the patella rotates around the patellar axis. Then there's a tibial rotation axis, which locates medial to the center of the knee. And the tibia locate, uh, rotates axially around this axis producing medial pivot motion. But many currently, many surgeons do not take these axes into account and instead aim to replicate the native joint surface. Now let's move forward to the hybrid alignment techniques. In adjusted mechanical alignment, the goal is to undercorrect the constitutional frontal deformity to a maximum of three degree. So this is a hybrid technique which takes into account the patient-specific alignment strategy as well as the mechanical alignment strategy. So the implant positioning of the adjustment is made on the femoral side as promoters of promoters of this technique aim to keep the tibial implant mechanically aligned. Now, what is the restricted kinematic alignment technique? The restricted 
the patient specific technique or the kinematic alignment is said to be unrestricted technique where we are not restoring the uh, alignment of the limb at all and the, the unrestricted technique can cause an extreme alignment that is considered as an outlier of the mechanical alignment TKA. So in restricted kinematic alignment, we keep the alignment in a safe range. The safe range of restriction is defined by the following criteria. Independent tibial and femoral cuts within plus or minus 5 degree and the neutral mechanical axis resulting in HKA within 3 degree of the neutral. This is the most recent concept, the inverse kinematic alignment in which the differences between the kinematic alignment and the inverse kinematic alignment is that in kinematic alignment, the knee is balanced by changing the orientation of the tibial cut, while in inverse kinematic alignment, knee is balanced by changing the orientation of the femoral cut. The native, native tibial alignment is restored corresponding to the tibial implant thickness on the tibial condyle. There is no soft tissue release which is involved. So the most recent is the functional alignment. So the aim of this technique is to restore the natural obliquity of the jawline, balance the knee flexion extension gap by fine-tuning adjustments of the tibial and femoral components, avoiding soft tissue release. No soft tissue release is done in any of these hybrid techniques. So this, for this, the robotic technology is a prerequisite to assess the implant position, resection thickness, joint gaps, limb alignment during surgery. And the first step is in imaging where a realistic reconstruction of the patient knee is, knee is created and in which the surgeon can plan bone cuts, obtaining the desired positioning of the implant and the limb alignment. So the femoral component in the coronal plane is inclined from the mechanical axis to achieve the correct balancing between the medial and lateral component com compartment. In the sagittal plane, the component is positioned to avoid femoral notching and follow the natural, natural bones moving. In the axial plane, the implant is aligned with the transepicondylar axis. There is no fixed three degree of femoral rotation in functional alignment. It can be, instead, it can be uh, balanced to plus or minus three degree to balance the flexion gap. On the other side, the tibial component is positioned to restore the natural joint inclination in coronal and sagittal plane, avoiding valgus position. position. The minimal adjustment or tibial position can be done to balance the knee. So, moving forward to CPAC classification. Uh, CPAC classification was introduced in 2021 by uh, by the Magdesi group. It was from the same group which discussed the concept of the constitutional virus. So they found that the average alignment in healthy population is about 1.3 degree virus with a standard deviation of 2.3 and 95% of the, of the studied population had a alignment between minus one six minus six degree virus to a three degree virus. And according to them, the during OA progression, the MBTA and LDFA chain late in the process when bone erosion has occurred. So until then the joint line convergence the angle progresses and it causes progressive cartilage wear and progressive ligament laxity on the convex side. So to classify the knee, first we have to find the joint line orientation. The joint line orientation is by is calculated by adding the MPTA and LDFA. If the MPTA plus LDFA is less than 180 degree, that the apex is distal, the MPTA plus LDFA, it is equal to 180 degree. The joint line, in, the joint line orientation is neutral. And if it is more than 180 degree, it is proximal. By just by eyeballing the standing X-ray itself, we can find these changes. Then the second is the we have to find the arithmetic HKA. Arithmetic HKA, HKA is the MPTA minus the LDFA. In varus knee, the HKA will be negative. Neutral, the HKA will be zero. In valgus, HKA will be positive. This also we can, this also we can find it just by eyeballing. And depending on, on this, they have proposed the CPAC classification in a nine box matrix. That is taking into the taking the concept of the alignment into concept, 
taking the alignment and the join line orientation into consideration. And based on their study, uh, the, the type 2 had in the, no, in the normal healthy population, 39.2 percentage of the people had the type 2 alignment. And thus, they gave, they found out that there are nine phenotypes for ONEs. And this is the distribution. The green dots are the distribu distribution among the healthy population. And here we have the distribution of the different CPAC alignments in the arthritic knee. So the uh, so the concept of CPAC classification is that we have to identify the each the CPAC type of each knee and we have to restore the patient specific alignment. In ortho one we did a study where we classified of classified the arthritic knees based on CPAC type in South Indian population and compared the functional outcome between the various CPAC types following mechanical alignment. And our our study served served as an initial exploration into the knee phenotype of the South Indian population. And in our study, there was no significant improvement of functional outcome among all CPAC types using conventional mechanical alignment strategy. So the take-up points from my talk are, there are four alternative alignment techniques to position TKA, which are challenging the traditional mechanical alignment. One is the anatomical alignment, adjusted mechanical alignment, kinematic alignment, and the restricted kinematic alignment techniques, basically. The kinematic alignment technique enables faster recovery and generally generates higher functional TKA outcomes in comparison to the mechanical alignment technique. But still, it is controversial. Longer follow-up studies are needed to define the value and best indication of each alternative surgical technique for TKA. And the mechanical alignment is still holds the gold standard for gold standard alignment and holds for all races, as it is very difficult to uh, to use tibial stump, etc. in in the alternative alignment techniques and. And in revision scenario, only mechanical alignment can be used. Thank you. Good presentation and uh, overview of uh, alignment techniques, Arjun. And uh, this is then uh, the very hot topic uh, which has been uh, discussed in all the conferences and uh, many uh, seminars being conducted uh, for this alignment concept. But uh, <clears throat> Uh, as you mentioned in the uh, various slides, uh, still the mechanical alignment is the gold standard and uh, it has shown the long-term outcome. Only the mechanical alignment technique has a more than 20 years follow till date since the Insol and Ranavat has uh, into introduced this concept of uh, neutral mechanical alignment. Uh, but coming to the other concepts of uh, uh, alignment technique, especially after 2000, uh, after this Bellman's paper, so that is a game changer in uh, introducing a lot of concepts with uh, different alignment concepts. But still, uh, still uh, uh, the alignment concept is slowly evolving and we need a long-term follow. And we have to understand the anatomy, but that is the only challenge because each ethnic group has a different uh, alignment concept I mean, compared to the Asian population, compared to the Western group. So that's what this McDesi has tried to explore in the Australian group. A different classification of nine phenotypes, but that is only it. Uh, the CPAC classification was done, it is in a static classification only with standing. We don't know what happens in the dynamic constitutional alignment. So, what happens when the weight bearing phase? So, that is the one a disadvantage of taking the CPAC classification. And coming to this mechanical alignment, and this is a, a dissatisfaction following a mechanical alignment is. You should not generalize that is because of neutral mechanical alignment. You must have noticed uh, well, the one example is uh, yesterday one patient was operated by robotics in outside center. Patient came with it's a well aligned uh, component, but the patient complains was it was done by robotics, but I'm not satisfied. We don't know which technique uh, they have followed, whether it could be a, a restricted kinematic or inverse kinematic or restricted mechanical alignment, but it is a well balanced knee. Uh, but the patient was not satisfied. But the dissatisfaction, the cause, maybe a, it, it uh, I would say it is a multifactorial. Uh, the, the alignment is a one concept, but you should not forget the other 
uh, the uh, important uh, factors which when you are operating the total knee. So the one is an alignment and you should not forget the balancing the knee. That is very important. And getting a good patellar femoral balancing. These three things is very important. So the one factor, if you take an alignment, the alignment concept, whichever the alignment if you are following, but at the end of the day, your knee should be well balanced and your patellar femoral joint should be balanced well, both in the coronal as well as in the sagittal plane. That is a very important one. You have to make sure on table. So it doesn't mean that if you're using a robotic and fancy name, like I'm using an inverse kinematic, I'm using a functional alignment, doesn't mean that you, 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 uh, you are compromising in the other uh, techniques. There's a other component of the well-balanced and functionally aligned knee. So whichever, because uh, the mechanical alignment has shown the uh, time-tested technique. So it has proven that the implant has survived for more than 15 years or 20 years. Still, the people are doing very well and functionally they are doing well. So only thing is the constitutional alignment concept. After that, the people have slowly started understanding what happens in the native knee anatomy and the advent of going with an robotics and more and more uni knee. So the people have started understanding why should we release more and why should we take uh, cut into the neutral. So that's the concept has arrived. But uh, whatever the technique we are following, it is reproducible. It should be reproducible and it should give a satisfactorily uh, good outcome. So that is very important. But with conventional instrumentation, it is very difficult to follow the all this hybrid technique. That is very important because by just by eyeballing, you cannot go with a three degree virus or three degree valgus in a femoral set. It is very difficult. So if you try to do with conventional instrument in instruments, you will land up in a higher degree of virus cut in the tibia and it might lead to the early failure. If you want to do that, you have to get trained very well in the conventional technique of making the neutral alignment, understand the concept well, then slowly progress to the using the navigation system then use a robotics and you have to wait for some more time to have a long-term data. So that is very important. So how this robotic assisted restoring the alignment comparing with the mechanical alignment. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Raj, in spite that we don't have all this robotics and uh, all that you're doing an excellent job. Excellent. Very good. You are talking about the case which came from uh, Rex uh, Hospital yesterday? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Now, uh, the, yes. see, about 10 years back, uh, it all came into big fashion and everybody bought and uh, uh, flashed in the newspaper. And uh, then there was a lull. You know, in fact, when I went, uh, was visiting some other place, they said, no, we have given up. So we are thrown out all in Germany. If you want, you can take, a, take all the equipment, they said. Okay. So now again is picked up. Yes. Is it is it only in India? Is it all over? Or what is what actually is uh, been fine tuned and foolproof or what is it? Yes, sir. It, it now uh, they have fine tuned the uh, alignment concept and the technique as well as the instrumentation, sir. Actually, uh, the, the robotics which are compared with the Maco ten years back. Now there are a lot of changes they implemented in the software analyzing the uh, on table performance. Now they are using imageless concept also. Previously, we had to do a CT. Now, without imageless, uh, also they are doing the robotics. And uh, number one, number two, uh, more of from the Western world, they started pushing more of like a robotics. So the whole world is now looking into the robotics. Now, without robotics and uh, uh, uni cannot be done. That's what they are promoting. And this Australian group, uh, uh, now the people are claiming that this classification is basically uh, to promote more of like a robotic based surgery rather than going for a universal mechanical alignment in all uh, nine phenotypes. Now they are more towards, trend is more towards uh, robotics. I mean, all the conferences in all the, even the big centers like Mayo, HSS, and there are two groups of surgeons, robotic and non-robotic. Now, what about the time taken? And is, is it a cycle? And uh, because in another five, six years, it's going to go back again? In your opinion? Uh, sir, probably in future, it's it going to stay, sir. Because uh, when they switch from the conventional to navigation, it took a lot of uh, cost factor and time. But now, because of this robotics, the uh, 
the time factor is only they are climbing is 30 to 35 minutes to arrange it initially but once you start doing it i think you can reduce the time factor but they could produce a good functional and well aligned uh, knee based on these different concepts but only thing is long term data if it is supportive i think definitely this technology is going to stay sir from the case that we saw yesterday yes it sir. looks as though it's going to go several uh you had to gain a lot of experience before you come to the stage yes sir thank you and the, the dr incidentally dr devraj going to present a award winning uh, paper in pune end of this week all the best yes sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you everyone good night good night sir good night sir good night